Good morning. A couple announcements in the back of the bulletin that I'd like for you to take a look at. One of them is the celebration of the anniversary for Grace Lutheran, the last Sunday of the month. There will be some activities between the two services and um, you're encouraged to bring your wallet along uh, so you might share in some of those uh, fun things. The money that will be raised will be used uh, for a better PA system and video so that we can put more of our services online. Also, uh, Bible school registration uh, is required, requested. Um, there are some forms in the back there that you can pick up also to remind yourself uh, in this week ahead that you would like to uh, register for Vacation Bible School. I have one uh, other announcement that uh, is brought to our attention that Judy Odata's uh, sister, uh, Mary Lou Moore passed away uh, yesterday, or last night. Uh, she had been suffering from cancer for a while, so we'd ask that you would pray for Judy's family. Um, Judy's mother is also uh, suffering from cancer. The pastor's vacation uh, is expected to last the rest of the week. Any other announcements? Okay, let us stand, please. <clears throat> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, and the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sins. God, our provider, help us. It's hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, we are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, we are shown God's mercy. We are forgiven and we are loved into abundant life. Amen. The share in our opening hymn, We Walk by Faith and Not by Sight, with one voice, number 675.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the tree of life, offering shelter to all the world. Grant us yourself and nurture our growth, that we may bear your truth and love to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. The first reading is from Ezekiel 17, verses 23, or 22 through 24. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live. In the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree, I make high the low tree. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. Thus concludes the first reading. Reading from Psalm 92, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 15. It is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. On the psaltery and on the lyre, and to the melody of the harp. For you have made me glad by your acts, O Lord, and I shout for joy because of the works of your hands. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree and shall spread abroad like a cedar of Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be green and succulent that, that they may show how up Right, the Lord is my rock in whom there is no justice. This concludes that reading. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 17. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So that whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must, must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to, our con or to your consciousness. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast with us so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, 
there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Thus concludes the second reading. Our gospel for this third Sunday after Pentecost is again reading from the fourth chapter of Mark. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He doesn't know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, and then the head, and then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, he goes at once with his sickle, because the harvest is come. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greatest of all the shrubs, puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make their nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them the crowds as they were able to hear. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. When I knew that the mustard seed story was to be the text for today, I was determined I was going to go out into the fields at home and find a wild mustard and bring it in for you. So that uh, maybe if I found the right one, it would have a bird's nest in it. But the wild mustard has pretty much gone to seed and I will pay that price of not having pulled them this spring, next spring or so when they start to bloom all over creation. Such is life with wild mustard on the farm. Such is, you know, this, this thing of life has a certain pattern to it. We are born by no effort of our own. And in time, we die. We plant seeds for vegetables and flowers and crops, and we hope to harvest before the frost comes and kills the plant. We raise fruit trees from seed or by grafting of a preferred type upon a rootstock of another of the same species. You know, our Old Testament reading gives us a picture of a cedar tree branch being grafted upon an almost dead stump. It'd be easier for you and me to understand part of this if Ezekiel had written about peaches or apples or pear trees. We understand grafting there. But again, it and the gospel lesson speaks of the selection process, the grafting in order to promote a better tree for growth. And then it asks how that growth can be compared to the growth of the kingdom of God. You know, the history of earthly nations and kingdoms is not unlike those of trees and plants. Kingdoms and empires rise, reach a certain level of power and might, have their day, and they fall away and eventually disappear. We remember from our history lessons of Alexander the Great, how his empire disintegrated almost immediately following his death. The Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, both had their day and they've disappeared. Many of us remember the fall of the Soviet Union, 
There are many who would say that the United States of America is reaching its zenith, this high point in the life of a democracy, and could be in its waning days of world power and influence. All of this might be true of earthly kingdoms and countries as we know them, but it's not true of this kingdom of God, which we're introduced to here today. Here is a kingdom that by all measure of human reasoning should have never gotten started or it should have died within a few years. But then that's all according to man's thought. God knew differently. Our Old Testament text and the gospel for today speak of that phenomenal growth of the kingdom of God. You know, a history lesson for you. God chose Israel to be his people. But then Israel miserably did not, uh, miserably failed and did not live up to their promise. From the golden age of King David, it degenerated more and more. The 10 tribes of the north had become destroyed already by the year 722 BC when they were swallowed up by the Assyrians. Only Judah, that small southern kingdom, was left. God's judgment descended upon them too. The prophet Ezekiel lived through those dark days and he tells exactly what would and what did happen using allegories and parables and then explaining precisely what he meant. Ezekiel tells how Nebuchadnezzar would take King Jehoiakim captive and take him as a prisoner to Babylon. In his place, he would leave Zedekiah as king, with whom he made a treaty and promised him some measure of independence. But then Zedekiah made an alliance with the Pharaoh of Egypt. And for that, Zedekiah was taken captive. And the last thing he saw before he was blinded was the murder of his sons, the last of the royal line to possibly rule Judah. He spent his last days in Babylon as a prisoner. Such was the judgment of God on the people whom he had chosen as his own. The mighty cedar that we have pictured by Ezekiel represents the kingdom of Judah, its royal house. The mighty cedar had fallen, but God would not be denied. The text shows us in a messianic prophecy how God would take a tiny twig from the highest branch of that great cedar and preserve it in a special place. Out of Israel from the house of David, that royal family, God would one day select an insignificant and lowly young woman to produce the greatest king of all ages. That tiny twig was to be none other than Jesus of Nazareth, many times referred to by Isaiah and by Jeremiah as a tender shoot growing from that dried up stump of the house of David. How true this was for Jesus. You know, a tender twig who didn't seem to have much of a destiny when he was born to a lowly unknown woman from a despised village of Nazareth. His birthplace was a stable, his bed a manger. In his brief ministry, he was constantly hounded by the opposition. His own family thought him to be out of his mind, both mentally and emotionally. Others accused him of being in league with Satan. He himself never owned a house of his own. At last, he was killed like a common criminal, suspended between heaven and earth on a cross. 
And then he was buried in a borrowed tomb. What kind of a king could this ever be? But now we know. Out of that tender twig grew the mightiest cedar of them all. His seemingly defeat on Calvary was turned into victory. He was received up into heaven and crowned with glory and honor. As Ezekiel rightly said, all the trees of the field, meaning all the kingdoms of the earth, shall know that I am the Lord and can bring down the tall tree and make the low tree high. For those of us who believe this mighty cedar has become our great tree of life. How great was he? You know, the greatness of a person is measured by the, the size of the organization that he oversees. Just look at all those well-known corporate executives and the massive salaries that they collect. The greatness of a president or a prime minister is measured by the stature of the country that they represent and govern. Kings and queens today are relegated to ceremonial roles, and you probably saw that on TV this week as the Queen of England hosted the G7 conference. Christ had a humble beginning. And so did his kingdom, a very small and insignificant beginning. Who was there? Well, there were those 12 disciples, common, uneducated men. Oh, yes, there was another 120 who stayed with him on many of his journeys. But what kind of a kingdom could that possibly be? What impact might it ever have on the world? we tend to judge by outward appearance. The smallest seeds grow into large plants. Jesus uses that illustration of the mustard seed in the gospel lesson for today. How is Christ's kingdom grown? Well, from that 120 to over 3,000 in 10 days, according to Luke's accounts in the book of Acts. Shortly after that, another 5,000 were added. And then multitudes were added to the church. Those believers were scattered everywhere that preachers and the apostles went, spreading the word. They turned the world upside down. Or maybe we should say they turned it right side up. Threats, persecutions could not stop them. In fact, it's been said that the blood of the martyrs became the seed for the church. We have Christ's promise that when the world can no longer bear his people, his kingdom of grace will become the kingdom of glory in heaven eternally. What does this kingdom mean for you and I? Do we have any real investment in it? A kingdom exists for the welfare and the protection of its citizens. Where do we look for protection, for safety, for security? Where do we look for help in times of trouble? Where do we look for our nourishment when we are spiritually hungry? For our shelter in times of the storms of life? You know, we can look to human institutions and we look to our civil and earthly governments. But what good does it do for us? You know, we pile up money in the bank. We buy big insurance policies. We can depend on social security and 401k plans. We can adopt new economic and taxing policies at the state or national level. We can form new social structures such as Facebook and Twitter and Google. We can support a large military. We can enter into all sorts of fast track treaties and alliances and all these we are putting our trust today. 
And yet we see how all of these can collapse very quickly around us. Surely there's a place for all of these strategies in our lives, but not at the expense of turning away from God. The case of Israel and Judah should be an example, evidence of that mistake that they made. God can and still put down the mighty, and he can still exalt the lowly. You know, the mighty cedar that our God has planted will never fail us. Ezekiel prophesies it will bring forth boughs and bear fruit and become a noble tree and every bird can live and nest in the shade of its branches. Here is protection for all. Here is nourishment for all of us as well. The kingdom of Christ is big enough for everyone. No race, no color is excluded. And so we read what the Apostle John wrote in Revelation. All nations and kindreds and peoples of every tongue shall be represented. There is no doubt that the kings of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. This is your king and mine. This knowledge should bring great comfort to you and assurance that this is part of our kingdom. And with that, I'll remind you or tell you that our next hymn is not going to be as listed on the bulletin, but rather number 699 in the book in your pew rack with one voice. In Christ, can we find refuge? Can we find a hiding place from the storms of life? In him can every enemy be overcome. In, in him our fear of death and the coming judgment is removed. And we don't need to call on any mountain to fall on us or any hill to cover us. All of this is true because in Christ we have found forgiveness for all of our sin. And we can find peace with God our Father. We can join with the Apostle Paul when he writes, the Lord shall deliver me from every evil and will preserve my soul. Oh, what blessed assurance. Let us stand and sing number, three, six, number 699, Blessed Assurance. Oops.
us join in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under his conscious Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. stand please after each petition of the offertory prayer your response will be hear our prayer holy god you planted the seeds of faith in every nation enliven your church so that the good news of your grace may root and grow throughout the world lord in your mercy creator god even the trees and the shrubs and the flowers delight in your goodness from the depths of the soil to the highest mountain, bring forth new plants, restore growth to places suffering drought and the results of massive fires. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God of the nations, we pray for our leaders and those in power. Grant them the ability to regard those under their charge with humility dedicating their lives in service to others. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, divine comforter, you show compassion to those in need and provide relief to those who call upon you. Bless all who suffer, especially people trapped in cycles of poverty and homelessness. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, sovereign God, this house of worship belongs to you. We give thanks and we pray for those who offer their talents of music. We dedicate to you the joyful noise that comes from this place, the cries of children, the melody of voice and music, instruments, as well as the songs from our own hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, we give thanks for our ancestors in the faith who are now at home with you. We look forward to that day when we are reunited in your new creation. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace as we pray the words taught to us by your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the blessings of God who provides for us, the God who feeds us, the God who journeys with us, be upon us now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ in the world. Thanks be to God. Our closing hymn is Go in Peace and Serve the Lord. <laughs>